Good afternoon. I'm Commander Ibad Khan, and I'm representing the Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity, COCA, with the Emergency Risk Communication Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I would like to welcome you to today's COCA call, Johnson & Johnson Janssen COVID-19 Vaccine and Cerebral Venous Sinus Thrombosis with Thrombocytopenia, an update for clinicians on early detection and treatment. Continuing education is not offered for this webinar. Closed captioning will not be available during today's webinar. A transcript and closed caption video will be posted on the COCA call webpage located at emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA forward slash calls forward slash 2021 forward slash call info underscore 041521.asp as soon as possible after today's live session. That web link can also be found at emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. All participants joining us today are in listen-only mode. After the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. You may submit questions at any time during today's presentations. To ask a question using Zoom, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, then type your question in the Q&A box. A video recording of this COCA call will be posted on COCA's webpage and available to view on demand a few hours after the call ends. If you're a patient, please refer your questions to your healthcare provider. If you're a member of the media, please contact CDC Media Relations at 404-639-3286 or send an email to media at cdc.gov. I would now like to welcome our presenters for today's COCA call. We are pleased to have with us Captain Tom Shimabukuro, a medical officer and the vaccine safety team lead as part of CDC's COVID-19 response, and Lieutenant Commander Sarah Oliver, a medical officer and co-lead for the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices COVID-19 Vaccines Work Group as part of CDC's COVID-19 response. I would now like to turn it over to Captain Shimabukuro. Captain Shimabukuro, please proceed. Thanks, I just wanna check that you have sound before I begin. Yes, Captain. Okay, great. Um, thanks for having me today. It's a, it's a pleasure to present to the, the group. Uh, today I'll be uh, discussing some background on uh, the CVST situation, and then I'll move into a description of the reports of uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis with thrombocytopenia at, following the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine, and then I'll summarize um, our preliminary findings. Next slide. Next slide. So just some basic information. Um, so platelets, also called thrombocytes, are colorless blood cells that help blood clot. And a normal platelet count is 150,000 to 450,000 per microliter. Um, healthcare providers, which most of you are, usually shorthand that, just say 150 to 450. Um, platelets stop bleeding by clumping and forming plugs and blood vessel injuries. And thrombocytopenia is a condition in which you have low, a low blood platelet count um, defined as less than 150. Dangerous internal bleeding can occur when your platelet count falls below 10,000 or below 10 platelets per microliter. Um, though rare, severe thrombocytopenia can cause bleeding into the brain, which can be fatal. Next slide. So, uh, the discussion around this issue or awareness of this issue uh, originated um, from reports of a rare um, but serious condition following AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine. And this condition initially recognized was CVST in the presence of thrombocytopenia, so blood clots in the brain with low platelets. Um, the the Europeans have looked into this and um, and 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 have issued um, several um, guidance documents, both broadly, um, you know, the European Medicines Agency and also individual countries have issued um, documents um, stating uh, their findings about a possible link between this rare condition and vaccination with AstraZeneca's COVID nineteen vaccine. Next slide. So this is a timeline of the Janssen vaccine. And I, I just want to, I should have mentioned on the previous page that the AstraZeneca vaccine is a, a chimpanzee adenoviral vector vaccine. 
um, the Janssen vaccine is a human adenoviral ve vector vaccine. So the Janssen vaccine timeline is as follows. On February 27th, FDA issued an emergency use authorization. The following day, ACIP issued interim, interim recommendations for vaccination. A couple of days later, those were published in the MMWR and became official. But vaccination started March 2nd. <clears throat> On March 19th, um, CDC and FDA received the first CVST with thrombocini, thrombocytopenia case report to VAERS. And these continued to um, be submitted to VAERS. Um, the, the latest report for this analytic period um, was received April 12th. The, the, the uh, investigation has continued. And on April 13th, CDC and FDA recommended a pause in Janssen, the Janssen vaccine. A HAN was issued. That's a health alert uh, notification issued by CDC um, notifying healthcare providers of this pause. And our investigation continues. I'll mention that we <clears throat> we were on the lookout for these reports based on um, the situation in Europe, and we're actually um, pre-screening or doing a pre-processing review of these VAERS reports, um, of VAERS reports as they came in uh, to the VAERS system and identifying um, uh, reports suspicious of this condition um, prior to them going through sort of the routine um, VAERS report processing process. And uh, we're doing an expedited uh, collection of records. Um, sometimes CDC folks actually reaching out directly and almost immediately upon receiving these reports, gathering these records and doing uh, physician reviews of these records and also engaging our clinical immunization safety assessment project here at CDC to pull in um, experts in vaccinology and subspecialists in hematology to help with the review of these reports. Next slide. So this is a screenshot of the CDC health alert that went out, um, uh, went out April 13th. <clears throat> and uh, I think the main messages or one of the main messages in here was that the CDC was going to convene the ACIP and they did that yesterday to further review these cases and potential implications on vaccine policy. FDA was continuing its investigation and until the process is complete, CDC and FDA are recommending a pause in the use of the J&J &J or Janssen COVID-19 vaccine out of an abundance of caution. The purpose of the health alert is in part to ensure that the healthcare provider community is aware of the potential for these adverse events and can provide proper management due to the unique treatment required with this type of blood clot. And I'll get into that a little in some later slides. Next slide. So this is a three-dimensional view of uh, the brain um, demonstrating the venous drainage. And as you know, the brain is a a vascular organ and therefore has extensive venous drainage. And you can see these large um, sinuses um, draining sort of into these common areas um, and providing the, the drainage system um, for, for the, the brain. And a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis would be um, a, a blood clot in, in some of these large venous sinus um, formations here. Next slide. So I'm going to give you a little back, uh, background epidemiology on CVST. I, I do want to mention that this is the epidemiology for CVST in general, not for CVST with thrombocytopenia. Um, that condition, CVST with thrombocytopenia, is really a, a very rare condition nested in a, in a rare condition. <clears throat> Um, and uh, the, the epidemiology of that condition, CVST with thrombocytopenia, is, is not that well understood, certainly not as well understood as CVST in general. Um, but the background epidemiology for this condition is it is, a, it is rare, around 0.22 to 1.57 per 100,000. It's implicated in about 0.5 to 1% of all strokes. It is a disease of younger people. The median age is 37. Um, although it is not unheard of in older individuals, you see 8% of patients greater than 65, and there is a female to male ratio of three to one. Risk factors include genetic or acquired prothrombotic conditions, 
oral contraceptive use, pregnancy in the postpartum period, malignancy infection, and mechanical precipitance. Next slide. So the more common presentations are isolated intracranial hypertension syndrome, includes headache with or without vomiting, papilledema and visual problems, focal syndrome, um, and encephalopathy. Uh, rare, more rare presentations include cavernous sinus syndrome, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and cranial nerve palsies. Next slide. Next slide. So the, our, the, the system we use to capture the data for this presentation is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, otherwise known as VAERS, more commonly by its acronym. Um, VAERS is a spontaneous reporting or passive surveillance system that is co-managed by CDC and FDA. And as a passive surveillance system, VAERS depends on individuals to send reports to CDC. Um, and, and anyone can report to VAERS, uh, patients, parents, caregivers, healthcare providers, and manufacturers are required to port to VAERS. And certainly for rare serious conditions like CVST, um, we really do depend on astute healthcare providers to recognize these potential adverse events and promptly report to VAERS. Healthcare providers um, are our partners in vaccine safety monitoring, especially during um, times like this, where we have a, a, a national immunization program where we're vaccinating large numbers of individuals rapidly. We really do depend on our partners out there on the front lines um, to, to recognize potential vaccine adverse events and to report those to VAERS. Now, VAERS is designed uh, specifically to rapidly detect rare serious adverse events that might indicate a safety problem as a Spontaneous reporting system, it's not designed to assess causality, but it is designed to detect safety signals. And in this case, I think this is a great demonstration of the robustness of VAERS, the robustness of the US vaccine safety monitoring system that we were able to um, rapidly detect um, a concerning number of these reports early on and rapidly assess the signal. Um, and that's to say that VAERS performed exactly as intended, and the U.S. vaccine safety surveillance system performed exactly as intended. We're able to quickly detect this problem, assess it, and now we're in the process of doing a more refined assessment to provide the necessary data um, to CDC and to FDA and to the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices to make evidence-based recommendations. Next slide. So this is just a, an overview of uh, the reports, a high level overview of the reports um, for the three authorized COVID-19 vaccines, starting off with Janssen vaccine. So um, during this analytic period, we have detected six reports. We've confirmed six reports of CVST with thrombocytopenia following 6.86 million doses administered. This is a reporting rate of 0.87 cases per million doses administered. In contrast, for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, there have been zero reports following 97.9 million doses administered. And for the Moderna vaccine, three reports following 84.7 million doses administered. However, all three of those reports after the Moderna vaccine had normal platelet counts. So essentially, after about 180 plus million doses administered of the mRNA vaccines, we have no reports of this rare condition, CVST with thrombocytopenia. And after about 6.9 million doses of Janssen, we have six reports. Um, we consider this uh, an imbalance in reporting rate for uh, this condition um, for these vaccines. Next slide. And as such, I'm going to I'm going to focus on the uh, the Janssen reports for the rest of this presentation. Next slide. So uh, here's some of the, the the general characteristics of the CVST with thrombocytopenia reports after Janssen vaccine. The median age is 33, ranging from 18 to 48. Median time from symptom onset was eight days, ranging from six to 13 days. So about 
These tend to become symptomatic around one to two weeks after vaccination. All cases occurred in white females. Um, in one case, the woman was taking estrogen and progesterone. Uh, there were no pregnant or postpartum women. And then you see some of the other pre-existing conditions there. I just want to note with respect to these cases, thrombosis usually does not occur in the presence of low platelets. So these case presentations are atypical and they were consistent with cases observed after AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. So here are some of the initial and late signs and symptoms. Um, they're, they're numbered patient one through six, but they're listed in no particular order. So the initial features largely included some general and non-specific symptoms, but most importantly, headache. Headache is the most commonly uh, is the most common initial presenting um, symptom, and you see in one patient there was back pain and bruising. I think what's important here is that, given the situation we're in, it's important that healthcare providers maintain a high index of suspicion when individuals um, show up and there is a history of uh, Janssen COVID nineteen vaccination. Um, if you look at some of these symptoms, headache, lethargy, and some GI symptoms, chills, myalgias, um, you know, these are pretty common in patients seeking health care. And unless you maintain that level of suspicion, um, it, it's possible that some of these patients may be sent home. In fact, that's what, what has happened in some cases. And then you see on the right-hand side, there are some of the later features, which are uh, a little more focal and, and tend to be more severe. Next slide. So um, I apologize that this table is in a different orientation, but uh, I think this orientation highlights the important part of this the important part of this table a little more clearly. And I want you to focus on the bottom right hand side of the slide where I have circled um, in red some of these locations of other thromboses. I just think it's important to note that in three out of these six patients, there was clotting in other large vessels, um, the portal vein, the pulmonary artery, bilateral lower extremity VTEs, right internal jugular vein and portal vein. So this, uh, th this syndrome appears to be um, a, a problem with clotting in general in the presence of thrombocytopenia. Um, CVST is, is, is what I think brought these to our attention, um, but but clearly there are other um, clotting issues going on, uh, at least in some of these patients. And as a result, as we um, further refine our investigation, I think we are gonna broaden um, what we're looking for to include clotting in other large vessels, not just limited to the um, cerebral venous sinuses. Next slide. I show you this slide just to, just to show um, SARS-CoV uh, to testing history. Um, COVID-19 disease uh, has been implicated in, uh, in, in clotting problems and thrombotic uh, events. Um, but if you look at the, uh, the testing here, it's fairly unremarkable in this case series of patients. Um, none of these individuals was actively infected and um, where testing uh, was done for serology, um, it was negative in three out of the six. The other three weren't tested or weren't documented at least. Next slide. Here's the hematology test results among the case patients. Um, all uh, had thrombocytopenia and um, many of them had uh, severe thrombocytopenia, so less than 50 platelets. And uh, five out of the six, had platelet factor four heparin induced thrombocytopenia antibody testing done. And uh, in all five where testing was done, uh, it was positive. Next slide. So here's some of the treatment and outcomes of these patients. Um, four of the patients uh, got heparin, um, and that's problematic, and I'll explain that in, in, in a little bit later. Um, Five got non-heparin anticoagulants. Many of these were switched to these non-heparin anticoagulants after recognition of what was going on. Um, 
three got platelets, three got IVIG. There was one death. Um, three of these cases at the time of this analysis remained hospitalized, two in intensive care, and two had been discharged home. Next slide. So in order to put this, what we are observing uh, into context for what we do, would expect, um, we, we did a quick, um, and I will say relatively crude observe versus suspected analysis. And I'll just walk you through how we came to our numbers. <clears throat> First thing we wanted to do was get a handle on the estimated annual incidence of CVST. And again, this estimated annual incidence uh, is based on is, is based on CVST in general, um, because that's where we have the, the, the data. Um, CVST with thrombocytopenia, again, is a rare condition um, on top of a rare condition, and th there's really um, limited data available on the incidence of that specific condition. But for CVST, um, our estimates range from about 0.5 to two cases per 100,000 population. We assume a risk period of 5.6% of a calendar year. Um, we arrived at that um, based on um, assuming that vaccination began on March 2nd, which it did, and then ran through the analytic period. That's 41 days. We make the assumption we didn't know at the time when these individuals were vaccinated. So we made the assumption they came in halfway through the, the period. That is the day's follow-up. And then we have to divide that by 365 because they're not being followed up for a full calendar year. Then we look at the doses administered in the, uh, in the risk group that we identified, which is women 20 to 50 years, and that's about 1.4 million doses. And then on the table below, we're basically breaking the annual, the estimates of uh, background incidents into chunks. Um, 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, and 2 per 100,000. We know what the observed is. That's the six cases. The expected, uh, observ the expected counts are based on the calculations I just explained above. And then you just do the arithmetic and you come up with a reporting ratio. And that ratio, depending on what you assume the, the background incidences, ranges from 3.8 fold increase up to a 15.4 fold increase. Next slide. Next slide. So just to sum things up, CVST is rare, but clinically serious and can result in substantial morbidity and mortality. It's not usually associated with thrombocytopenia. The observed cases following Janssen COVID-19 vaccine appear to exceed expected based on background rates of CVST among women aged 20 to 50 years, um, threefold or greater, as I just showed on the previous slide. All six of these reports were in women age 18 to 48, all with thrombocytopenia, and there were no obvious patterns of risk factors detected. Uh, CVST with thrombocytopenia has not been observed after the two authorized mRNA vaccines. So 182 million doses of these mRNA vaccines administered with no report, no reported cases to date. The clinical features of the Janssen cases are similar to those observed following the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine in Europe. And both Janssen and AstraZeneca vaccines contain replication and competent adenoviral vectors, a human for Janssen and a chimpanzee for AstraZeneca. Next slide. Uh, this is copied straight out of the CDC health alert notice. Um, uh, and I think the important points are this, uh, what I mentioned before, clinicians should maintain a high index of suspicion and do not treat patients with thrombotic events and thrombocytopenia following receipt of Janssen COVID-19 vaccine with heparin unless PIT testing is negative. Next slide. And for our public health partners, we encourage healthcare Please encourage healthcare providers and the public to report all serious and life-threatening adverse events and deaths to VAERS as required under the EUAs. And for the public, um, if you have received the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine and develop a severe headache or other symptoms, please seek healthcare. Next slide. And I want, want to finish up by um, emphasizing the importance of reporting to VAERS. And here's some information on how to report to VAERS. Again, healthcare providers um, out there seeing patients out there 
treating patients out there in the front lines are our partners in vaccine safety monitoring. We depend on you. We depend on astute healthcare providers to recognize possible adverse events and to report those to VAERS. Uh, I want to uh, reinforce that um, for serious adverse events, um, you, you will likely be contacted by VAERS or by CDC to request medical records. And I want to reassure you that HIPAA permits reporting of protected health information, so of providing uh, medical records to CDC, um, to VAERS, uh, um, providing this information to public health authorities, including CDC and FDA. Um, there, there, there are no uh, HIPAA issues um, with, with providing this information to CDC, and we appreciate um, your cooperation, and we appreciate um, the prompt reporting that we have received of these medical records when requested throughout the pandemic. Uh, next slide. So uh, some next steps, we're going to continue our enhanced monitoring VAERS and then other vaccine safety monitoring systems like the vaccine safety data link. Just to note in our vaccine safety data link, we've had a relatively small number of Janssen doses administered, but zero cases of CVST so far. We'll investigate potential cases through detailed clinical reviews and chart reviews, and we'll better refine and now we'll, we'll refine analyses to better quantify risks. The, the observed versus expected I showed you made a lot of assumptions. We're working on a more, uh, a more robust analysis where we have individual level data on when people got vaccinated so we can calculate our numerators and our follow-up uh, time a little bit better. So there'll be um, better information coming on that particular analysis. Next slide. I just wanna acknowledge um, the contributions of the uh, investigators from the following organizations. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Sarah Oliver. Great, thanks, Dr. Shimabukuro. I am happy to go over um, kind of the similar events, but with a focus on uh, the vaccine policy aspects of it. Next slide. So then again, just to back up slightly and talk about these adenovirus vector vaccines, there are two uh, adenovirus vector vaccines used either in the US or in Europe, the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, he, uh, Dr. Shimabukuro briefly went over some of this, but the Janssen vaccine is one dose, uses a human adenovirus 26 vector. An EUA was issued in the US in February of 2021, and the EMA has authorized this for Europe, but doses have not yet been delivered or administered. The AstraZeneca vaccine is two doses, a chimp adenovirus vector, and is awaiting EUA application in the US, but it is approved uh, and has been in use in the UK and Europe. It's seen after both of these COVID advector vaccines. The clinical syndrome seen after both vaccines appear similar. However, we're still learning the extent to which these cases represent the same syndrome. Next slide. So last week, the European Medicines Agency, or the EMA, released a report that concluded a strong association and probable causal link between the AstraZeneca vaccine and rare clotting events. In the EU, they had 62 cases of CVST and 24 cases of splenic vein thrombosis, both with thrombocytopenia, and 18 of those were fatal. Most However, due to different ways the vaccine has been used in each country, they can't draw specific conclusions on age or gender as risk factors. From the US, I mean, from the UK, uh, there were 79 cases of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia, 19 were fatal, 44 were CVST, 35 were other clotting events, 51 were male and 28 were female, they estimate the risk at four per million, but acknowledge that it's slightly higher in younger age groups and a specific rate wasn't uh, supplied. Next slide. There were two papers released in the New England Journal of Medicine earlier this week that uh, both described case series with clinical and lab findings 
of these uh, thrombocytopenic thrombotic events after the AstraZeneca vaccine, one from Germany and Austria, and one from Norway. Um, many had platelet activating antibodies directed against this platelet factor four. And again, it's a phenomenon that looks like HIT or heparin induced thrombocytopenia, but these individuals had not received heparin prior to developing clots. So the authors of these uh, papers propose a, a new syndrome entitled vaccine-induced immune thrombo thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or VITT, V -I -T -T, as the name of this emerging syndrome. Next slide. So the EMA Safety Committee does not make vaccine policy for the EU, and each country has to weigh the risks and benefits individually. Many countries have adopted an age-based recommendations for the AstraZeneca vaccine, and they're listed here. Next slide. So next, moving to um, the policy discussions over the past week regarding the specific issues with the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine, both discussed in the work group and then yesterday at the ACIP meeting. This included uh, the risk-benefit balance, which evaluated uh, the review of this CVST cases, risk of COVID disease by age and sex, COVID-19 vaccines administered, Janssen doses administered to date, uh, projected supply of COVID-19 vaccines, uh, and then policy options were discussed for use of the Janssen vaccine, which we'll walk through as well. Next slide. So the work group reviewed the six cases of CVST reported to VAERS that were just described, all among uh, women 18 to 48 years of age, with an interval of vaccine receipt onset, uh, from vaccine receipt to symptom onset, ranging from six to 13 days. Uh, there was also a case of CVST reported in the Janssen phase three trial in a 25 year old male. Um, he developed symptoms nine days after vaccination and on day 21 uh, was diagnosed with the CVST and ultimately found to be anti PF4 positive as well. Next slide. So next, just briefly walking through overall COVID epi, it's difficult because the exact risk factors for CVST are unknown. So we can't highlight the epi among the specific population only at risk for CVST, but we can discuss the epi by sex and by age. This slide shows COVID cases and deaths by age, I mean by sex. Overall, females represent a slightly higher proportion of overall cases on the left in blue and a slightly smaller proportion of COVID deaths on the, red, on the right in red. Next slide. Then this slide shows COVID cases and deaths by age group. The bars in blue on the left show percent of cases by age. You can see that the younger population represents a higher proportion of COVID cases relative to the percent of the US population shown in gray. However, on the right, in red, we see deaths by age group. And as we're all familiar with these days, the oldest population represents the substantial portions of death from COVID relative to the younger populations. Next slide. So then if we move to overall COVID vaccination coverage by age, you can see here that among the oldest population, those 65 years of age and older, Nearly 80% of those of that population has received at least one dose. 40 to 50% of adults aged 60 to 64 years of age have received at least one dose. And then 25 to 30% of those 18 to 39 years of age have received at least one dose of a COVID vaccine. So this highlights the proportion of the population who is yet to be vaccinated with any COVID vaccine. Next slide. To date, there have been over 7.2 million doses of the Janssen vaccine administered to date. And if we limit to the, the population to females 18 to 50 years of age, there have been approximately 1.5 million doses to date. Next slide. However, there's another way to think through the doses that have been administered. From currently available data, thrombocytopenic thrombotic events develop six to 13 days after vaccine receipt. And we know there's around 7.2 million doses administered. So if we think through those doses from the beginning of the program, the Janssen vaccination program, so early in March through March 30th, 
there were 3.4 million doses or 48% of all doses administered. With a risk window of up to two weeks after the dose administered, it's likely that if these vaccine recipients were to develop thrombocytopenic thrombotic events post-vaccine, they likely would have already occurred. However, if we think through the doses administered within the last two weeks, from March 30th through April 13th, 3.7 million doses have been administered, or 52% of the doses overall, have been given within these last two weeks. Therefore, the thrombocytopenic thrombotic events post-vaccine may still occur after these doses as they still remain within that risk window. Next slide. So just to summarize what we know so far, thrombocytopenic thrombotic events have occurred after the AstraZeneca vaccine. In the US, we've seen six cases reported to VAERS of CVST and thrombocytopenia after receipt of a Janssen vaccine. No cases of CVST with thrombocytopenia have been reported after receipt of either Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. These cases have occurred primarily in younger adults and females. We know that CVST can be clinically devastating or fatal. And then it's also worth highlighting that in the US, alternative COVID-19 vaccines, the mRNA vaccines are available. Based on current projections, the supply of both mRNA vaccines are expected to be fairly stable in the near future. Therefore, the choice may not be receipt of a Janssen vaccine versus remaining at risk for COVID. The decision may be receipt of the Janssen vaccine or receipt of an mRNA vaccine. Next slide. However, we need to highlight what we don't know so far. We don't know the true background incidence of CVST with thrombocytopenia. We don't know specific risk factors for these thrombocytopenic thrombotic events. We don't know the incidence of other thrombotic, so non-CVST cases with thrombocytopenia after the Janssen vaccine. We don't know the ability to compare or generalize thrombotic cases after the AstraZeneca vaccine to the Janssen vaccine. And we don't know the true incidence of these thrombocytopenic thrombotic events and CVST after a J&J &J vaccine, after, as more cases may be identified in the coming days to weeks. Next slide. So now just to highlight the policy options that were discussed yesterday by ACIP. Next slide. There were several overall discussion points uh, that were highlighted um, when discussing the policy. First, that the reported CVST cases are rare, but once limited to doses administered to the age and sex of CVST cases seen, the observed cases exceeded the expected cases. Given the timing of doses administered, additional cases may still be identified. But an em emphasis that robust safety surveillance is critical. The fact that we've had these discussions so quickly after these cases were identified demonstrate that signal detection and evaluation of these cases occurred as planned, moving to public discussions of these safety issues and policy implications as soon as possible. Next slide. So there really is a spectrum of policy options for the Janssen vaccine. ACIP has and will continue to discuss the entire spectrum of policy options with a full risk benefit assessment. So ACIP could decide that the risks outweigh the benefits and vote to not recommend use of the Janssen vaccine due to these safety concerns in any population. ACIP could decide uh, that the benefits outweigh the risks overall and recommend the use of the vaccine in all adults 18 years of age and older. However, there's an option in the middle of the spectrum as well, which could involve recommending use of the Janssen vaccine in some populations with potentially age or gender specific recommendations, such as adults 50 years of age and older or males only possibly. Next slide. So to walk through what is overall and recap what has happened so far this week on this issue, on Monday, the Vaccine Safety Technical Group met to discuss the safety signal identified. Tuesday, the ACIP COVID Vaccines Work Group met to discuss these issues and policy options. And Wednesday, yesterday, we had the emergency ACIP meeting. And so the purpose was to consider the implications of reported cases of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia after J&J &J on the, uh, after a Janssen vaccine on vaccination policy. 
I'm sure some people were able to join the call yesterday, but what happened in summary yesterday was that ACIP had a thoughtful discussion of the data presented and heard from a variety of stakeholders on this issue. Ultimately, the committee agreed that more information is needed before a decision on vaccine policy could be made and that CDC will collect additional information and convene another ACIP meeting as soon as possible within the next two weeks. During this time, CDC and FDA will continue to identify and evaluate any cases within the risk window, identify and evaluate any past cases that may come to light because of the uh, recent notifications around this. We call this stimulated reporting formulate more precise data around observed versus expected rates, uh, including uh, for specific demographic populations and undergo a formal risk benefit analysis, then this will be brought back before ACIP for additional discussion as soon as possible. Again, planning for that to occur within the next one to two weeks. Next slide. So Dr. Shima Bakoro highlighted this, but I just want to end on these important notes from the Han. Um, as this is a clinician uh, focused call. So for diagnosis and treatment, if there is concern that a patient could have CVST after receipt of the Janssen vaccine, evaluating the patient with the screening PF4 ELISA assay, also known as the HIT assay, and consider consultation with a hematologist and do not treat with heparin unless the HIT testing is negative. Um, in addition, what we've learned to date is that these patients have presented with thrombocytopenia, so a screening CVC could also be informative to assess the likelihood that the patient has a specific thrombocytopenic thrombotic event. And as always, if a case is detected, please report to VAERS. Uh, next slide. Okay, I think that's my last slide. So Dr. Khan, I'll turn it back over to you. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, uh, presenters, for uh, providing our audience with such beneficial information. We will now go into our Q&A session. Audience, please remember, you may submit questions through the webinar system by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and then typing your question. Also, please understand that we receive hundreds, if not more than a thousand questions during some of these Q&A sessions, so we simply cannot answer every question. However, we will answer as many questions as we can during this part of the call. So starting with our uh, first question, we have, um, in fact, a couple of questions related to patients uh, receiving dialysis. And the questions ask, should heparin be avoided in dialysis patients who have had the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? And should platelet counts be followed prospectively in dialysis patients who have received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? This is Dr. Oliver. I'm happy to attempt to take a stab at this and see if Dr. Shimabakura has anything else to add. So um, I, ultimately, we would say we're not kind of proactively saying everybody needs who's had a J&J vaccine, has had the Janssen vaccine, needs to start getting serial CBCs or, or anything like that. It's more if, um, if somebody presents for medical care with um, a concerning symptom, that is a test that could be done. Um, in a, in addition, um, the concern around heparin is, you know, once the clot has been identified, could the heparin um, make it worse if they have developed this condition? If there are specific concerns about the anticoagulation treatment for any specific patient, though, I would absolutely recommend consultation with a hematologist um, and, and additional discussions on that particular individual for what would be best for that. Dr. Shimon McCurro, anything else to add? I agree. I don't have anything to add to that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next question asks, uh, during the um, reviewing of the data that you received, did you notice any correlation with vaccine lots when it comes to these patients? Oh, we did not. Um, keep in mind, there are only six cases. Um, so it's it's hard to draw any conclusions about um, an N of six, but we did not observe any issues with any particular lot. Thank you very much. Um, another question we received is uh, when characterizing, characterizing the headaches as a symptom that you mentioned, did the patients describe the headaches similar to 
what patients uh, describe when experiencing an aneurysm or something similar? Uh, I don't have the specifics of the 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 the, the narratives um, that were given either in the report or the medical record, but um, the the initial from from my understanding, talking to the reviewers, the initial presentation or the initial symptoms were not particularly notable. Um, they were somewhat, you know, non-specific um, headache and 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 fatigue and and just feeling unwell, um, but but nothing that would really just stand out to to, to make you think that, in, at least initially, um, that that there was that there was anything unique or special going on. Great, thank you. Um, next question asks: uh, Can you elaborate what role can VSafe play in reporting an intervention? So VSafe is primarily a relationship between the, the VSafe system and the individual patient. And during the first week after vaccination, we, we, we do daily check-ins and we're asking, we're, 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 we're soliciting symptoms. So individuals um, will, through an electronic survey, report symptoms back to us. Um, the, the value for VSafe in, 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 in detecting um, clinically serious uh, adverse events following vaccination is if a person does seek medical care, that information is transmitted to our VAERS program and VAERS would follow up to take a report. Um, but as, as far as just the basic VSAFE um, reporting, the VSAFE process, um, it's probably less effective um, in, in monitoring these types of events. Keep in mind if a these are these are very serious events. These people wind up in the hospital in the intensive care unit, and um, VSafe depends on people sending information to CDC. And in that situation, we think it's unlikely that a person would be able to actually send this type of information. Um, but again, um, if if a person does report seeking medical care, we would reach out to that person and make an assessment. Thank you, sir. Um, another question we've received is, are you aware of any other adenovirus vector vaccines with similar uh, adverse events? So there are, other, there are other adenovirus viral vector vaccines. I believe at least one of the Ebola vaccines is an is a adenovirus viral vector vaccine. Maybe Dr. Oliver can confirm that. Is that correct? Yes, yes, there's okay. an ADD-26 Ebola vaccine. So, so uh, my understanding is there, these, these events were not observed after that vaccine, but the, the, that vaccine is not as widely used um, as the AstraZeneca vaccine and as the Janssen vaccine. I think maybe the use was on the order of, of hundreds of thousands. Here you've got millions to tens of millions of doses. So it's not necessarily surprising that you wouldn't have seen, um, picked up these rare adverse events um, when the doses administered are not that great. Thank you very much. Our next question asks, um, should patients who have had the Johnson & Johnson vaccine have any blood tests drawn prophylactically? And if not, are there any other proactive steps that uh, they can take? This is Dr. Oliver. Yeah. Um, so we're not recommending um, any proactive prophylactic, you know, treatment or monitoring of CDCs. Um, again, if a patient develops for uh, presents for medical care because they're concerned um, uh, that you know they have some symptoms, then I think a CBC can be part of that initial evaluation. Um, but we're not recommending that otherwise people who feel totally healthy and are fine um, have, you know, serial monitoring of CDC, CBCs or, um, you know, I saw in the chat people asking about taking aspirin or anything like that. We're, we're not recommending that at this time. Tom, anything else to add to that? No, I agree. Thank you very much. Um, Next question asks, were there any instances of orbital edema um, observed in any of the patients? 
I'm not aware that that was a, a sign uh, in any of the case reports um, that we that we became aware of. And a, and a question I have uh, from the audience is, can you elaborate on how long after receiving the vaccine these events took place for the various patients? This is Tom. Um, let me find my, I want to make sure I give you the right information. So the, the median time to symptom onset was eight days and it ranged from six to 13 days. So I, I, I will caveat that by saying that determining symptom onset um, is, is part art, part science, um, and, and, and often involves the judgment of the, the person reviewing the records. Um, some of these symptoms can be um, somewhat insidious uh, in onset, but um, our, our review, and it's a detailed review of these reports and these medical records, leads us to believe um, that these cases occur within about one to two weeks or become symptomatic within about one to two weeks. Thank you so much. Um, another question asks, so um, have um, the CDC been able to draw any conclusions yet from any such cases from J Johnson & Johnson's trial data? There was one case from the clinical trials that was in a, a male. Um, certainly, um, the, 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 now, uh, one, one case in a clinical trial um, does does not definitively um, does would not allow you to to conclude that there is a safety problem, but but there was one case observed, um, and because uh, because there were similar um, cases being observed um, in the post authorization surveillance after AstraZeneca, um, and, and they both use adenovirus viral vectors. Um, we were certainly looking for this. And so we were doing enhanced monitoring in the United States during the post authorization. So I would say the, the clinical trial data for, for um, the Johnson vaccine in combination with what was being observed um, following the AstraZeneca vaccine and the fact that these are similar vaccine platforms had us um, monitoring closely for this condition. Thank you very much. Uh, next question asks, uh, do you have any advice for uh, oncology patients that are on drugs which normally decrease their platelets? I, I um, would say that this, any uh, decisions about kind of treatments um, or anticoagulation should absolutely be made with people taking care of the patient, uh, recommending consultation with a, um, with a hematologist. Um, I can say that we have been made aware that the American Society of Hematology will be releasing a resource on um, uh, uh, this, what we're seeing, this kind of uh, thrombotic, uh, thrombocytopenic event within the next day or so. Um, and we're happy to provide the link to where those will be posted. So um, that uh, website link can be uh, provided in the additional resources to, uh, to the COCA call. So we can link to that. Um, I don't know that they'll specifically address um, oncology patients, um, but I know that uh, we're partnering with other professional organizations that potentially can speak much more to kind of detailed treatment recommendations than, than we are able to. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. And for our audience, uh to be able to find that resource that Dr. Oliver was referring to, please direct your browser to emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA and find this COCA calls um, webpage and you will find that resource listed under additional resources. We will be posting it shortly. So it might be um, an hour or two after the COCA call where you'll be able to find that resource. Uh, we have time for one last question, uh, and the question is, um, since this is such a rapidly evolving situation and novel uh, um, adverse event that's developing, 
what can clinicians do to get more information as uh, things develop and evolve? And what would be the next steps that they should uh, keep an eye out for? So this is Tom, and I, I, I'll say we, we are committed um, to providing vaccine safety information in as timely and a transparent manner as possible. I know that the ACIP will be meeting on a more frequent schedule um, specifically to get updated information on the situation. The ACIP meetings are public and, and, and anyone can attend. And we will also, CDC will also be, um, you know, making information available through its normal um, ways, whether that's online postings or conducting briefings such as this one. Um, we want to get this, we want to make sure that people get the most updated information um, that we have available in the most transparent manner as possible. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today with a special thanks to our presenters. Today's COCA call will be available on demand a few hours after the live call. You can find the video recording of today's call at emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. You'll also be able to find those additional resources that Lieutenant Commander Oliver was referring to. Continue to visit emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA to get more details about this COCA call and other upcoming COCA calls. And please share the call announcements you receive with your clinical colleagues. You can also sign up to receive weekly COVID-19 science updates by visiting the link listed here in the slides. And you can also find this link in the slides posted at emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. COCA call announcements for upcoming COCA calls and other COCA products are sent via email. In addition to visiting our webpage, please remember to subscribe to COCA to receive notifications about upcoming COCA calls or other COCA products and services. Be sure to subscribe to receive notifications by going to emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. Again, that's emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. We invite you to join the COCA mailing list by visiting the COCA webpage and clicking on Get Email Updates and entering your email address where indicated. To stay connected to the latest news from COCA, be sure to like and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash CDC Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity. Again, thank you for joining us for today's COCA call and have a great day.